All right. So for tonight, for tonight, God gave me a message talking about pride and ego and the relinquishing of both of those things. Now, last week we talked about surrendering self, and you'll find that there is a lot of, this message almost dovetails off of that because there's a lot of like, there's a lot of shared points. And we also did a message about spirits of pride uh, just a couple weeks back, and I'll actually link that into the, um, into the description because that is another kind of facet of this. Um, see, the, the thing about pride is how slippery it is and how easy it is. Tonight, we're looking more at something in the soul, something in the, in the emotions, in the, in, the, in the mind more than a spirit that's attached itself. Spirits of pride, they get you into pride. But you understand, like, the demon tempts you and lures you and, you know, manipulates you in various ways in order to get you into a, a, a psychological state. You don't need a demon to hit that psychological state. The reality is, is that pride and ego are innate. They're like things that just happen in our hearts. And... I, I, unfortunately, there are aspects of this that are a little like wonky. I mean, even even the description of Satan, his fall, pr pride was found in his heart. Like he became proud of who he was, and that's what caused him to fall. So there's this facet to pride that has the ability to creep up in the hearts of beings, even without, even beyond, like a thing to consider is that satan was the first is is known as being the author of sin right and pride was what led him to sin to become that thing so there is a thing to this to kind of look at and in some ways pride in in and of itself is its own entity its own kind of thing that snakes into the hearts of those who have authority, who have power, who have place, who have anything at all to grab a hold of. Influence. Influence another, yeah. So there's a place for us to look at this, but the the bigger thing here is just to is just to highlight that this is something that needs to be addressed at all times. You know, we talked last week about surrendering self and the importance of shifting the focus of things onto God. Like, it, and in the end, to sum up the <laughs> the message on surrendering self as much as I can, um, the way you surrender yourself is by putting God first. Like, you put yourself behind God and then you let him be the most important thing in the story and in some in many ways pride overcoming pride and ego is requires a, a similar kind of methodology but or methodology yes i said the word right yay i'm so glad we do this in one shot and i have zero <laughs> editing abilities <sighs> i'm gonna hold on to this for the next time you use big words. <laughs> Uninvited. <laughs> Uninvited. Yes. If you used the big words and you were invited to do so, this would be different. I'm going to figure out a way to work anti-establishmentarianism into this message. Just to spite you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Let's just go. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Methodology. Methodology. Did it. It's a word in English. Um, 
it's a different methodology because the reality is, is that with pride pride is more pride pride runs deeper so we talk about like last week when you talk about the surrender of self you're talking about the surrender of your identity and while your identity can have uh, roots in pride or pride can be a thing an anchor of identity it is its own thing and that's kind of what i'm trying not so gracefully to express it's like its own alien yeah species yeah yeah <laughs> that all right lord save this message from me <laughs> i was about to say don't pretend you know everything about alien species, real and unreal. Anyways, pride. We're not going to... This message is going off the rails because we're about to start talking about <laughs> Gorn and Betazoids. And that's <laughs> that's not where we need to be. Um, back in, Lord. <laughs> pride. Talking about pride. All right, look. <clears throat> The gist of it is this, is that the reality is that when we talk about pride, we're looking at something that runs deeper inside the core of a person's being than just than just the face level stuff about like identity and different things like that. Because like I said, uh, pride can be, can have roots in identity. Like you can have pride in your identity. That The person who you are can cause you to become prideful. Who you see yourself as, who you saw yourself as, who you want to be. All of these things can become means by which pride snakes its way into your being. But it's not necessarily that those things in and of themselves are bad. Like, for example, you could be like a legitimately gracious person who truly loves others. And then... You'll find one day that when somebody questions you, you get offended by the fact that they questioned you about your love for others. Why are you offended? Well, when you dig a little deeper, you'll find that the offense is generated by pride that you have in yourself for who you are. It's astounding. Let me let me pose a question because this is this is ultimately geared towards Christians, um, regardless of who's watching it. Why is it that when when you when you look over everything that you've done in the day, if you are somebody who who follows God and if you consider yourself a person of the law, as it were, let me let me pose a question. Why is it that you still have to, if you do everything right, if you follow all the laws, all the commandments, if you do everything that you're supposed to be doing and say no to everything you're supposed to be saying no to, then why at the end of the day do you still find yourself having to repent of pride? I lived that life for a decade where I committed myself, I considered myself a man of the law. <laughs> I regret that, but I did it. <laughs> the thing of it is, is that I, I followed everything. There were days, I, I've have, I have people for years, I've listened to pastors say things like, you know, I, there's not a day that I don't sin. And it's like, really? There's not a day? Because I did it. I had days where I committed no sins. I had days where I, I checked very hard what I did and did not do. And by all accounts, I committed zero sins. It's not impossible. I know some people like to say it is, but can we be, can we be honest about false humility for a moment? Because we're going to have to come back to it. We're going to talk at length about false humility in this message because it is a part of pride and ego but a lot of people just say that thing it's just something it's not something they actually believe it's not something that they actually do it's just something that they say in order to cover themselves 
for the inevitability that they will sin or the possibility that they have committed some sin that they didn't know about. I know. I did it. I said the same thing for years. I I thought many times that, you know, oh, well, I have to cover myself. I have to, I can't say that I didn't sin today. That's wrong. Until one day I, it dawned on me that that's foolish. That's not realistic. That's lying to yourself. That's lying about you to you. And God knows better. Because what you're doing is you're trying to control a narrative that you're making up. So, but nevertheless, I still found that no matter how good I was in a day, I would start, if I did good in a day, I'd feel really good about it. You know, look at, <laughs> look at me. I didn't sin today. And then day two would come up. I didn't sin that day either. Then day three would come up. And day three was always the one that got me. Because day three would come up of no sinning. And you know what, I, what I'd catch growing in my heart? Pride. Every time. Truth be told, if I probably would have found it there already any of the other days, but it wasn't until day three, four, sometimes day two, sometimes day one. How would you know if you sinned or not? Because the way that I was gauging whether or not I had sinned yeah. was based purely off of the law. Okay. Because when you have a list, yeah. or when you take things in here that shouldn't be a list of, goods, of do's and don'ts and turn them into a list of do's and don'ts, you suddenly yeah. have an incredible list yeah. of things that you should and should not do in the day. And if you, if you pull it off, then you can take pride in yourself and still have to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that was like, I think where that gets really off is we think that we can look at ourselves and determine if we sin or not. <laughs> Love, don't get ahead of the message. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm just trying to sound smart. <laughs> humility <laughs> I mean if you're if you're just gonna say it then fine whatever we'll just jump to it rather than me continuing to talk about this <sighs> so as Heather said the place where that becomes off is that you're gauging your own goodness So much more. It said, anyway. ask you the Holy Spirit, search my heart, and tell me if you see any wicked way in me. <laughs> Do you want me to preach the message? <laughs> I guess so. I mean, you may as well just go for it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't have to. Uh, that's what happens when you have a genuinely a genuinely humble person sitting there and being the uh, being the <laughs> <Prime message. laughs> for sitting as, as the observer for a pride message being taught by somebody who struggled with pride <laughs> this message is going bad anyway that's why he said that you need more humility to do it this way <laughs> yeah okay I'll stop So, since we're being forced to push f a lot further into the message, I guess it'll shave us an extra 10 minutes off. Yeah, the, the problem that ends up happening here is this. See, when we take a litany of rules and we try to use that to determine our goodness, like we talked about last week, we talked about how, well, I will reference the message on um, on sacrificing self a lot because it these things work together. 
it's foundation for what we're talking about today. Think of it like one's dovetailing off the other. In this case, so if you haven't watched it, you may as well go watch it. Um, but I, I'll try to like express the key points here as well. Um, but basically the, the struggle here is that in many places there are, in many places in the Bible, there are things distinctly laid out as do's and don'ts. Then there are things in the Bible that are not laid out as do's and don'ts. Take, for example, the Beatitudes. Now, I have had many, many arguments over the years with people about the Beatitudes because many people look at the Beatitudes, especially in the modern church. The Beatitudes are taught as being a sort of Ten Commandments given by Jesus. The problem with that is, is that that is a 20th century-ish perspective. That is a modern perspective of what Jesus is saying. That is not a first century Jewish perspective on what Jesus is saying when he lists out the things in the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes were not meant to be a list of do's and don'ts. He wasn't saying, be humble, be meek. He was saying things that were actually very much inflammatory. When he says, blessed are the peacemakers, you understand that the peacemakers at that time, you see, we, we hear peacemaker and we say, oh, obviously that's what we should be doing because Jesus was a peacemaker. Ignore Matthew 10. Jesus was a peacemaker. He came to bring peace. He came to bring harmony with the Holy Spirit. He came to be this thing. Yeah, yeah. Actually, no, no. Actually, what he was saying is was actually very inflammatory to the Jewish people at the time because peacemakers were people in under Jewish rule or were Jews under Roman rule who didn't want war with the Romans. Mm. They wanted they wanted peace. They wanted the Roman. They didn't they weren't interested in in fighting back against the Romans and freeing Israel from their rule. They they were content to stay under Roman rule. They were con considered traitors. And I could go on. Like the Beatitudes, I, I've gone through various studies and sermons on the Beatitudes themselves, but I, I use this one example as a point for time's sake. This is the, this is the problem, though. Another example, which we gave in the message about sacrificing self, was the fruit of the Holy Spirit when Paul expresses those in Galatians. He expresses the fruitless deeds of darkness and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. None of those things are things to be committed to. When he talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, he expresses it as something that's happening due to the presence of God. Um, it is the Holy Spirit that changes your personality, that lets you become peaceful, that lets you become loving that lets you become gentle because these are not things that you accomplish you don't decide you're going to be a more loving person and just become a more loving person everybody should know that we we keep trying to convince ourselves that we have the ability to control to change the way that we think about things in such a way that like we're going to fool our own minds into believing something. I mean, there are people who legitimately brainwash themselves and that's a different thing, but it doesn't change their emotional self. You understand like your your emotional self is its own thing. Just like your intellectual self is your own thing. Your intellect your intellect is not going to be able to correct your emotions. Instead, what will happen is it will, you'll twist your emotions and try to convince yourself how you feel about things and your emotions will still feel the way they do. All it will be is you saying, no, I don't feel that way. No, I don't feel that way. No, I, I don't feel that way. All the while, there's something inside of you that's just clawing because you feel that way. <sighs> Self-control is is a fruit of the holy spirit 
<laughs> it's not something you force. You can choose not to act, but that's still just behavioral modification. And in all these things, like my, my point in bringing all of these to the fore is this, is that these are things that are innate. These are not things that are meant to be a list for you to follow. They're a list for you. You can look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit and you can determine what you don't have, but you can't make yourself have it. You can ask God to change you. <laughs> and, and the truth of the matter is, is that it's purely a, an ego trip to think that you can change that. The think, to think that you're going to make yourself a more peaceful person. You're going to find harmony with the universe in such a way that you can just become more peaceful. You're going to exercise whatever demons are inside of you in order to make yourself more peaceful. You're going you're gonna to go get into fights and you know get that angry energy that you're carrying around. Exercise that chip on your shoulder in order to make yourself feel more free so that you can feel more peaceful. You still have the chip on your shoulder. All you're doing is expressing it. It doesn't make you better. It means that you're not carrying it anymore in a way. You're just getting a chance to use it to bludgeon people around you. You're not different. If you were to stop doing what you were doing and go back to what you were doing before, you would, it would just creep up on you again and just drive you crazy again. And that's the thing about it is in the end, this behavioral modification stuff is pure pride and ego. It's purely us trying to take control of our own person once more as always in order to establish our own person our own thing and lay that out as being what's real and then we take pride in it see pride we we make the mistake so often of thinking that of pride in a one-dimensional sense and that is simply the feeling of pride we think of pride in the sense of well i take great pride in myself oh yeah, that's a sin don't do that but pride runs deeper than that. Pride is so much more subtle. Pride is setting yourself on the seat of judgment. Is It's taking mm -hmm. verses where God says to judge rightly. Where Jesus says, "Look at you look at the weather and say it's going to look like this. So judge rightly. And then we take that and say, ha, now I will judge. And because, because God, Jesus said judge, I will judge. We ignore the part where he said judge rightly. We ignore the part where he, he does so from the Holy Spirit. And just f to be clear, if anybody like doubts that Jesus was moving in the Holy Spirit, he says as much in John 16. The same spirit that I have will be given to you. That is the counselor. When I die, you will receive my spirit, and then you will do all the things that I have done in my Father's name. in John 17 as well the thing about it is is that we our focus is on ourselves pride is a self-focused thing it is not it is not just that welling up of um, fulfillment and self-satisfaction that makes us think of ourselves in some grandiosity we might not even think of ourselves in grandiosity we might think of ourselves as lower than the people around us. There's such a thing as a covert narcissist. We talked about this in the in the narcissism message a few a couple years ago. But covert narcissists are people who they are narcissists. Like they they very much so have all the traits of being a narcissist. The difference is is they don't manifest it in the way that other people do. Well, your typical narcissist will sit there and like, you know, tell you how great they are and how amazing they are and how they're awesome and like, you know, try to convince you. Brag about their money. They'll brag <clears throat> about their money. They'll try to convince you to believe that they're just as awesome and they'll try to fish for compliments and try to get you to tell them how awesome they are. Covert narcissists still have that thought process 
The way they do it, though, the way that they live and manifest, however, is by not saying those things, not doing those things. They will reserve them for when something goes wrong. Oh, if only I had, if only other people could have seen how good I am. Oh, I was so good. I was so good back in the day. But, you know, I never got my chance to shine because, you know, things were unfair. And this person's fault and that person's fault and everyone's fault. The same thing that a regular narcissist would do if, when something doesn't go their way. Covert narcissists do it the same way. Because in their heart of hearts, they're still believing the same stuff. They just don't bury you under it. Pride works the same way. Yeah, they kind of use it in self-pity. Yes, exactly. Exactly. They use it in self-pity. Why, does, why doesn't anyone see how great I am? Yes. Whereas the thing about, <clears throat> the thing about pride is that it, it masquerades the same way. Like I said we'd come back to false humility. False humility is false because you don't believe in it. Ooh. False humility is something that you tell people in order that, so that you don't have to look prideful. False humility is something that you might convince yourself of because you don't want to acknowledge that you're prideful. False humility is the tool is the tool of the person who wishes to delude themselves to per, I, to overcome pride instead of being honest and overcoming pride. False humility says I'm not a prideful person. But false humility is false because it's still dripping with pride and ego. It is you trying to take control of the narrative about yourself and how people perceive you. It is not you actually being free of pride. You still have the thoughts about how great you are. You still have the thoughts about how good you are. You still have the thoughts, the belief, the deep-seated satisfaction in yourself that says that you are right and just in all ways. That you're the best. But you're not going to tell people that because that would be prideful. So you're going to tell people that you're less than that because that's humble. That is a deeply shallow understanding of humility. But it's not uncommon. <sighs> a couple verses. <clears throat> I've got a, a few different verses to look at, but. <coughs> There's uh, two that are kind of in tandem with each other that we're going to pop open and look at because it, it, it's direct, directly attached to this discussion about pride. You know, the thing about it is, the thing about it is that as followers of Jesus, pride is a, is a very, very real danger to us. The, we oftentimes note how the Pharisees had great pride, and they did. They, they did so many different things in order to like, state their pride and enforce it, lay it out before everybody else so that everyone could see once and for all how amazing they were. Look at the size of my phylactery. Look at how long my tassels drag. <laughs> huh. Anyway, um... I hadn't thought about it that way that before. They, but they did so many things. They took so much pride. I mean, they tithed their spices. They they went above and beyond in so many different ways, in order to just prove themselves better than everybody else because they needed to satisfy their pride. And that's something we'll get into in just a little bit. But the first things first is just to highlight this thing of like where how do we overcome this. How do we overcome this? Like, what is it that we need to be looking like? In Matthew 18, starting, in ver starting at verse 1, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in, in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called the little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, 
Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. We'll stop there. And we'll go over to uh, Mark 9. Which is a, it's a similar, it's a parallel verse. Mark 9.33 They came to Capernaum. When Jesus was in the house, he asked them, the disciples, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Then he took a chi little child whom he placed among them, taking the child in his arms. He said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. See, the thing about these passages is where Jesus highlights this thing, this reality about the kingdom of God, which is that of looking, giving an honest account of who we are, but in such a way that is truly humble. See, Jesus isn't interested in our pretending to be humble. Even if you really want to believe that you're humble. You either are or you're not. That's all. You can, you can try to be humble. But if you're not humble, you're not humble. And this is kind of the thing that we need to like take account of. Is that pride, as, as I said earlier, it's kind of its own entity. Even outside of like demons and different things like that, it is its own kind of cancer, its own illness, its own kind of uh, kind of like its own kind of ill in the soul. And the thing about it is, is that we, as a result, we can't expel it by pretending it's not there, or by trying to act like it's not there. Or by trying to change how we feel about it. It has to go. It has to be laid out before God. It has to be changed by a power greater than our own. Amen. You will not overcome pride by choosing to overcome pride. Mm -hmm. And then trying to pretend it's not there by, by acting humble. That's, that's just raw ego. That's such an... If, the fact that we think we can achieve humility in and of itself it's just where our heart's at yeah yeah see the thing about it is and, and, and I keep bringing up ego because it's just as pertinent see ego uh, ego is a, a part of the identity uh, by definition and even though we're, and even though there's very much so kind of a thing where we're kind of like highlighting it in the context of pride, being egotistical, as opposed to being, you know, just that being your, that part of your identity that you express. The thing about it is, though, is that like, 
that identity that we express is something that we're very much caught up in. And when we're caught up in it and expressing it, that's something that we're holding very true to. Like it's something that we are, we are enforcing, we are, we are carrying. It doesn't matter. See, the, the thing about it is, is that true humility, when, when Jesus expresses who the greatest in the kingdom of God is, in, in the one verse, in both, both illustrations, he takes a child and puts, them in front, puts it in front of them. Mm-hmm. And he says this. The innocence, the innocence of children is the thing that he's trying to draw attention to because mm-hmm. innocence is humble. It's teachable. It's teachable. See, the thing about the thing about so many of us in as pride kind of encroaches on us is kind of the the bed, the fertile ground that it finds to grow in, especially in the church, is knowledge. See, the, the greater we the more we learn about God and how to follow God, about how to make God happy, the the greater our pride tends to become because we know how to do things. We know how this works. We, our knowledge takes on a life of its own and suddenly we know the way. We know how to get there. Trust me on this. I know what I'm talking about. (laughs) I, it, it'll come to points, and I have fallen to this one myself, where you start to come up to places where you look at you look at the grandiosity of all that God is, and say, "I'm content with what I know." Mm. And there are, and the thing about it is, is I say this knowing that there are people who will watch this and judge me for it, and that's fine because I, I know you're not different. <laughs> You can you can judge me. Um, so the thing about it is is just this. Like we we need to kind of take and acknowledge what Jesus what Jesus illustrates here, this innocence, this place of just like wonder and teachability and that's something that can be taught um and there's we got a verse that we're going to go look at here in just a moment but before we do just to not leave what we've just read you know the other part is that he talks about how the greatest in the kingdom of god is the last and the servant of all there's another verse where jesus highlights this point where he says the king the son of man did not come to to rule but to serve Mm, yeah for even the son of man came not to not to be served but to serve because the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the servant of all and when you look at the reality of it you watch jesus carry his disciples through so many things you want to pull it up and then once you got it we can read it um you know we watch him carry his disciples and at the end of the last supper you know jesus (laughs) jesus washes their feet purely to he humbly and honestly washes their feet with the intent of purifying them as much as he can everyone except judas who it doesn't say he didn't wash his feet either it just says has jesus afterwards saying well all of you are clean except one of you one of you's not but by that time judas had already made plans to betray jesus He was already marked 
out for destruction. So it's important for us to, to stand on this principle, to understand that humility, being humble, is like is a part of that childlikeness. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about like sacrificing self, it was under the grounds, under the context of being removed from who we were and coming into that new creation, being that new person who we're called to be, right? Well, when we surrender ourselves, our pride has to go with that. You can't keep pride. And the reason why we have, we're spending 40 minutes through trials and complications and the odd alarm. <laughs> um, is because pride has its own, is its own animal to defeat. And the thing about it is, is that pride is insidious enough that it can actually weather the storm of change that happens and can happen when we go and aggressively begin to surrender ourselves. Because understand very clearly, like, when, when Jesus says, die to yourself, carry your cross, that is an aggressive action. That is an action that you take. And how hard you push into it is something that you determine. You say, you say how hard you're going to go for it or don't. You, that's why you see followers of Jesus who range from the people who come and they, they, uh, they say the sinner's prayer, they repent of their sins, and then you watch them come back to church a few times, and then they stop coming, but they still tell you they're a Christian afterwards, as if going to church was the metric. But the point is, is that you'll watch their life degrade back to where they were because they, nothing changed. They were not, they weren't resolute in their desire to meet Jesus. They were resolute in their desire to feel like they did what they did in order to not be threatened with hell. On the other side, you have those crazy guys who uh, they say the sinner's prayer and they repent of their sins and they're off to the races and they're fighting and striving and you know suddenly they're showing up to church they show they were in like they were in like they look like a white like a white wrapper the day before and then the next sunday they show up and they're wearing the full like the black tie white shirt formal attire and they're screaming about jesus because they've gone head over heels and just dove straight into the extreme deep end because that's how much they want this. It's two very different extremes, but that's the point, is that how hard you go is yours to decide. You decide how much you want it. How much you surrender, how much you give, that is your choice. That's on you. Even to the point of like when we talked about it last week, where uh, Heather posed the question about like, well, what if you, what if your will is different? Well, you can ask for a new will. You can ask for God to change your will. How much of that you do is on you. Like you will be the one to say how much you want to change. But pride, pride will determine how hard you fight, how far you push. Because if you find yourself taking pride in the identity of being a, a new believer, you'll fight very hard in order to get, achieve that validation. Because that's what pride does. It aims for you to acquire validation to be able to say that you're good enough or that you're right or that you're the best or that you're this or that you're that. It, it pushes for you to feed your ego, to build on it, to create a grander version of yourself. And some of those people that fight so hard to become that extreme version of Christianity, 
a new believer, they push because they like the identity. They're infatuated with the power. They're infatuated with the, the idea. They're infatuated with who God, who they think God is. They're infatuated with the idea of being the pastor. And that's what they're after. But if you show up and you think that you're good enough just as you are, you just need this little seal that says you don't go to hell, then you end up in the other boat. You end up in the boat where you, you don't keep going, you don't care, you just you say the prayer, you feel good enough, and then you're done. Because you're already good enough, you don't need to change. You need to be different, you just need to know that you're not going to go to hell. And then you can continue living just the way that you were before, because your pride tells you that you were fine to begin with. Like I said, pride is far more insidious than just working one way. It will take you down either of those extremes. It's not something we want to rely on ourselves to be able to detect. Yes, exactly. So, but the thing about it is, is that with, in both of these instances, the one may be, the one could be, the one extreme could be developed by a legitimate move of God just as much as it could be moved by a legitimate move of pride. It just depends on what they're going for. Simon the Sorcerer wanted the power of God. That's what he wanted. He wanted the power. Yeah. He didn't want Jesus. He wanted the power involved. The thing about it is, though, is that, like, as I was saying, you know, in, in this way, how much we we fight and strive like how much we hunt how much we go there's so many different facets of it that will be driven by who we want to be but again that harkens back to what we've been saying about pride and the threat of it the pitfall of pride is that it's about you the sacrifice of self is about jesus and that therein lies the difference here. And this is where we need to focus because the reality of it is is that the way that you overcome pride is where your focus is. If you want to be able to detect it, consider why you do the things that you do. Do you want to prove that you're good enough for God? That's pride. That's ego. If you if you want God to like if you want God to like tell you how good of a boy or girl you are. I, I know, I, I did it, I was this guy. Uh, that's because you're seeking validation. You're seeking validation because you need your pride. Your pride needs to be fed. This is why it's so hard, okay? We all carry an element of pride and ego. Even if you don't carry pride itself, ego's different. Ego, the ego has a way of allowing pride in, but it also has a way of being its own twisted little animal that seeks validation and craves the same thing. Because in both cases, they're both going to have you reaching and clawing for an identity, for a purpose, for the validation of being recognized in this way or that. Pride will have you grasping for the validation of whatever it's attached to. Ego will crave the validation of knowing that itself is valuable. And whatever you, the identity that you have crafted and attached to it, that that is validated and that is good enough. But Jesus isn't interested in your fabricated identity that you're expressing and putting out into the world. <laughs> Jesus is interested in your pride and how much that that how much that needs to be satisfied. No. Jesus is interested in you. Yeah. Jesus is interested in your heart. Jesus is interested not in the superhero that you aim to look like. He's interested in the kid that you were. Last week I spent a lot of time talking about how 
in the message about surrendering self, I talked about how not everything that God created in us was bad. No, no, no. You, you have to understand there's a portion of you that is still the same thing that God looked at on day number seven of creation, saw it was good, and was able to rest. Because you are made in his image. His breath is in your lungs. His son died and was saved. Or died and was resurrected so you would be saved. You mean everything. But he has to mean everything more. He needs to be your focus. Because you're his. He didn't go through all these motions and fight, for all, fight all these fights. Jesus didn't come to be a peacemaker. Jesus came to give, give us the ability to defeat our enemy. The enemy he was he showed us, gave us the keys to defeat was the devil. Okay? Just so we're clear on all of that. He, brought, he came to give us the keys to defeat the devil. That's what the prophecies were about. The Israelites didn't, weren't interested in hearing about that because they wanted to be free from Rome. That was their enemy. Jesus' enemy was Satan. God's enemy is Satan. That's who he came and gave us the power to defeat. Luke 10. We struggle so much with pride because it, it preys into these different things where we feel that we need to go. Because in our world, pride rules it. Pride is what drives us to act a certain way, to be a certain way, to seek the validation that we need to find in order to stand above everybody else. It's what makes us idolize kings and queens and people of high value like that, rulers and so on. It doesn't it's why we don't revel in the glories of the of the the common man. If you read uh it's why people find uh, European history more interesting than Japanese history. Japanese history, once you get past the, or sorry, modern European history, more fascinating than modern Japanese history. I should be more specific. Modern European history is full of uh, kings and queens and events and wars and all kinds of things that are just so much so fascinating for us to watch the kinds of things that the prideful that the pride that the prideful can take pride in whereas modern japanese history post world war 2 is a lot of activists fighting with activists and political upheavals it's not very exciting it's a lot of common men and women making significant ground in society and whether it's making a better or worse society is debatable but the reality of it all is that it's rather peaceful by comparison we don't take a lot of pride in that we don't really see the value in that as much because it's not grandiose we In this world ruled by pride, we oftentimes struggle to see the value of the small things. So when Jesus props a child down in front of everybody and says, be like this, the disciples just came from casting off demons and, well, failing to cast off demons, actually. That was what happened on the way to Capernaum. And then they started debating who, the best, who was the best one of them. It's a whole thing, though, that we, they, they fed into their pride in the face of defeat. Because, again, pride lets us feel validated afterwards. Kids don't need to feel validated afterwards. They, they can accept a loss. Unless they have somebody that they're trying to prove that they're valuable to. Innocence is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's... It's one of those things that we, if we could just 
appreciate it and hold on to it, then we could be a lot safer. We could do a lot better. We could, we could receive so much more from God than we do. But innocence isn't good enough. But innocence doesn't satisfy the way pride does. And God is not interested in satisfying pride. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through it... through its wisdom, did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than, the hum than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Hmm. Last verse, and I'll throw out there before we talk a little bit about that. Um, is first Peter five starting in verse five. In the same way, you who are younger submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. That was uh, First Peter five. <clears throat> the thing about it is, is that pride and ego are oftentimes the centralizing figures that push us to believe that we're going to accomplish anything in the face of God that we're going to prove ourselves to be good enough, that we're going to acquire um, salvation. They're also the centralized things that let us look at God and say, you're not good enough for me. Oh. Oh, wow. That let us stand up and beat our chests in his face and say, well, look at me, I'm so great. Look at how magnificent I am, look at how I am more humble than you. <laughs> like, a lot of the world really believes that, though. They do. There's a lot that of... That they're more humble than God. There's a lot of the world that believes that they're more humble than God, that they, be they believe they're more gracious than God. More compassionate. More compassionate. More good. 
It's all a, it's all an ego trip, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, we. we <laughs> so many people are completely content to beat each other up over minor inconveniences. I. I can't tell you how how tempted I was the other day to just hop out of the car and beat the hell out of somebody who uh, nearly sideswiped us. Yeah. I mean, my Heather was in the car, and this person first they drove out into oncoming traffic. Us. Just about t-boned. Just about t-boned us, and uh, then proceeded to veer out in front of us. Then we all had to stop at a stop sign. It was a quick walk from my car to theirs. And I was angry enough to put a hole in that window and aim for whoever was behind the wheel. Didn't matter who it was. I wanted to hurt them. And yet, people like me are more than content to question the compassion of God. Oh, but you were protecting the one you love and yada yada yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know how, how many people God loves? All of them. Every single one of them. And he protects them. You ever consider the magnitude of having to love everybody all at once while having to watch them hurt each other? Oh, man. Oof. And knowing that the fates that they're, they're pulling each other into are worse than anything that you would do to them. Mm. Knowing that there are worse fates that lay ahead for those who would reject you over whatever happens. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine watching everyone that you love fight with each other and hurt each other and reject you in the process blame you for it Man. you have we have no idea no actual idea what it is like to sit in God's perspective and yet we'll beat our chests we'll judge we'll try to judge each other We'll talk about his lack of compassion. We'll call him a narcissist. We'll say all kinds of things. All because we we believe that we are right to judge. Just because we can. The thing that we need most is to surrender those parts of ourselves. You know what God looks like when you're humble? Amazing. Do you know what you look like when you're humble? Honest answer? Amazing. True humility doesn't deny good in order to pretend to look humble. That's pride. Mm -mm. It's only false humility, which is just closet pride, that has us denying truths about how good or bad we are in order to try to perpetuate an image. The funny thing about, like, innocent children can be told that they're good at something, and they believe they're good at something without pride. All they're doing is stating a fact. I'm a good baseball player. (laughs) My dad told me so. That's why I go out there with the confidence in knowing I'm a good baseball player. Are you the best baseball player? I don't know about the best, but I'm good. (laughs) You consider that with somebody who has pride. We don't... 
We don't need to spend a lot of time on this. But the point is this, is that there's a place where the world and its wisdom and its knowledge of who God is and who we are and different things like that has crafted and molded a series of images. And we don't, we don't see it. And the irony is, is that it's even crafted fake images of what we should look like. So we don't always recognize pride because sometimes it just looks like somebody being righteous or somebody being just. And yet in that, I, I, some, some person in the, some person who has chosen to, I, it's like, it's like looking at somebody from Antifa who has chosen to beat up Nazis and saying that they're a more righteous person than somebody that just picks a fight on the street. It's justified. That's all pride. It's pride that has us judging other people this way. Judging that one is more righteous than the other. You don't know what the guy rando is fighting on the street are about. We, we don't have the right to do that. We don't have the right to do that because we don't know. We presume to know, and that comes out of pride. Mm. We can all say that this is not right, that the, the violence and so on is not right. But it's what we, when we start putting ourselves in a seat and crafting an opinion based off of our assumptions, that we start feeding those little pride demons. And that's something that we need to overcome. That's something that needs to be laid down because that's coming out of our own perspective, our own wisdom, our own beliefs and the wisdom of the world. But then we say, well, no, I'm not actually doing that. I'm just, I, I wouldn't actually like make a judgment about that. I'm not a judgmental person. I'm a good person. And then we quietly make those judgments anyways, because that's actually how we are. but we believe that in order to not be a prideful person we have to look not prideful looking not prideful doesn't mean anything oh dang as I said early on as I said early on you are either prideful or you are not that's all you are either humble or you are not. That's all. You will not make yourself more humble. You really won't make yourself more prideful. I walked around for years commenting on how beautiful I was. I've never seen myself as that attractive. I have, I have people who, I have people who like would have known me when I was in my early twenties and how often I I said how like beautiful or glorious I was and whatever. I was certainly prideful. I was certainly arrogant. But I, <laughs> but I had no illusions about my appearance. It was all a joke to me the whole time. But people, some people legitimately believed it. <laughs> and that was unsettling, actually. I remember many times where I found people actually believing what I was saying. And I'm just like, ah, 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 don't do that. I'm not that guy, not really. Uh, it all kind of has its own ebb and flow. And as a result, since it has its own kind of life, it's something that's not in our control. And it's something that we are going to have to surrender to God because he has the power to defeat it. But we do have to surrender it to him. We do have to acknowledge what real humility, what real greatness in the kingdom of God looks like. Because if our interpretation of being great in the kingdom of God is the, is the man on the pulpit with the best, with the, the, the nice clothes <clears throat> paid for by the church, 
all that we have is the same value of goodness that the Pharisees did. We're just not obsessed with phylacteries and tassels. We're obsessed with a different image. Even Job. Job, uh, Job had an issue that was kind of, that was drawn out in all of his struggles. I know everybody, everybody reads Job and they quote the first two, the first two chapters because there's 40 of them and they're a nightmare to read through. I hated it. <laughs> I legitimately did. I was really interested and I still suffered through some of it. But. Yeah, exactly. You wanted it. You were like... And I really wanted it, yeah. You were like, yay Job, and then they say everything three times. I got triggered at every angle. Yeah. The thing about it is, is that like, the book of Job is a nightmare to read for a lot of different reasons. but. The one thing that gets missed, and it's believe, I believe it's in about chapter, oh, it's in chapter 34 or 35, I want to say. Maybe, maybe 37. I don't, it's, it's been a while. But it's when Job starts talking about himself and justifies himself. And he says how much he, he longs for the days when when people would open the gates for him, when they would all rise when he entered the room, when when the young would get up for him and move so he could take the take the seat of honor. the seat of honor at the table. Yeah. Job had a thing that he had things that were off with him in that regard. And it was br finally brought to light at the end of all of that. Everything that happened, everything that he lost, everything that he lost, and he missed the seat at, of honor at the table. He had three kids die, and he missed the seat of honor at the table. Legitimately, if you take what he says that he missed, and you draw the parallel with, and you read what Jesus says about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, you will find parallels. The things that he's criticizing the Pharisees over, that he's rebuking them over, are things that Job yearned for. Ooh. But that's the thing. That's how, that's how insidious pride is. It's even so much so that even now, like most people who, who go and read Job, they they still sit and say Job was the this honorable man. He never fell away. He never showed anything of in terms of sin. But it was right there. He said it. It was in his heart. And people still miss it. Because that's how pride is. It's commonplace. It's so easy for us to, to look at, to see, to perceive and to live in and we don't we don't let it go because we like it it's what we understand and that's what makes it that's why this is a separate message and it's almost it's over an hour long okay. it's because it's so deep and i understand that there are parts where i'm kind of like in some ways, I feel I've kind of stumbled through this message, but the reality of it is, is that it's all here. The struggle with pride and ego is that they are satisfying to us. We like them. We like the validation that pride makes us feel. But we can't have it and also exist in the kingdom of God. The last person to have pride in the kingdom of God was Satan, who had to be cast down to earth and then started a war against God because he, because he had pride. Mm -hmm. We can't have pride and Jesus. 
Not really. And the value of understanding that, the value of recognizing that, and more than anything, the value of living free of pride is being able to live free because pride will wrap you up and it will hold you. And not in a good way, more like an anaconda. Yeah. It's going to smother you. Well, it's going to asphyxiate you. It's going it's to push the breath out of your lungs until you die because you keep needing to validate it. You keep needing to prove that you're good enough. You know how many Christians I've met in my 11 years in service to the church that had so much pride that they constantly had to prove themselves in order to be validated? Do you know how many, how many arguments I've seen born witness to or had been involved in because somebody desperately needed to be right about the scripture that they were quoting or the perspective that they were offering, even though nothing in the Bible actually backed them up. I don't have a count for you. It's just an incredible number, though. I know that some of them were me. I was the guy who needed the validation because I had pride. I don't think it's completely gone. <laughs> <laughs> that's, You're gonna take it down. That's a, that was a cheery swing, yay, yay, team pride. The point is, is that it has to go. It has to go. You can't have both. Wow. It has to go because it's gonna kill you. It's gonna kill you because it's gonna keep you away from God. You, you know how many times like, I've, I've, I've listened to so many people over the years? And mind you, like there, there's a contingent of people who could watch this video and have no idea what it's like to hear from God. You go to church, you, you commit yourself, you read the Bible, you say your prayers, but you've never heard God's voice. And to you, I tell you, keep going. Keep pressing in, keep pushing, and ask for that. And if anybody tells you that God doesn't want to talk to you, they're a liar. And rebuke them, because that's Satan speaking through them. I'm not, I'm not joking. Like, full, full on, you can call me whatever you want. That is reality. Even per the Bible, that is reality. Because when D Jesus died and was resurrected, he died and was resurrected so that we could be redeemed. And what we were meant to be redeemed into was the same relationship that God had with Adam. Mm. They walked together. They talked together. Yes. If you're not walking with God and talking with God, you're not fully there. Yeah. Which means there's so much more for you. Not really living yet. But for those of you who have, who know what it's like to hear from God, and there, there are some who, <laughs> you know what it's like, you've heard God talk to you, and you don't, never pressed in. And then there are those of you who hear from God, and you do press in. There's a whole place for us to recognize where we hear from God. To know and to receive. But more than this, we need to like it, pride will come up and it will stop us from going where God tells us to go. And I've known, I've watched it happen so many times where I've seen people go from not hearing from God and saying, wherever God tells me to go, I'll go. And then when they do hear from God and God tells them where he wants them to go, they say, actually, I don't want to do that. Oh, man. I, I can't, I, I don't have the fingers for it, but a lot. Honestly, like it's about 15 people, like realistically, I have watched, I've watched about 45 people move from that place of not being able to talk to God to being able to receive and hear from the Holy Spirit. And I've watched of those people, it's about 15 ish of them that I've watched receive the words and say no. And it's only about 15 or so because a lot of the other ones kind of came and went 
their season with me was over and they progressed on to whatever their next point, part in life was, wherever God was taking them, assuming that they went with him. But I can, I can, I can remember these people distinctly who received the Holy Spirit. They heard from God. Baptism of fire, the whole shebang. And when they heard from God finally, they said no. Because they didn't want what he wanted. Pride was too significant. Pride. They didn't value him more than their pride. Exactly. And as a result, you know, the relationship went where it went. I can think of a couple off the top of my head where they, I don't even know if they have a relationship with God right now. I know one doesn't. Straight out. But that's the, just the reality of it. I, and I'm a small sample size. 11 years in the church, I only have so many, so many people in my spheres that have come and gone. But nevertheless, that's what it looks like. How much more so is that going to be? Just going from church to church to church. Millions of people. We can't have pride and have God at the same time. You can't have the Holy Spirit and pride. They will not live together. You can have them for a time. Your pride could be buried underneath so much. That's where we get double-minded. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very much. Yeah. That's where double-mindedness comes into play, and we find ourselves struggling so hard against God where he's trying to draw us into things, and we're telling him, I don't trust you. I don't think that that's correct. I don't know that I believe that. I don't want to do that. I don't think that's good. We referenced Jonah in the last message. Jonah had the pride to sit before God and tell him that he didn't want to be sent to Nineveh because he knew that, Nineveh, that God would have mercy on the people of Nineveh. Like, uh, he spends the first period of the whole message, like, running, and you don't know why. It's not until the end of the book that he finally expresses to God, this is why I ran from you. This is why I did half of what you told me to and then left. Because I don't want to do it. I don't want them to have mercy. I am going to be the judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not our place. So, in all of this, it's a must that pride needs to go. <laughs> this night, man. Pride needs to go, and you okay, Harley? Yeah, he's fine. The dog's fine. Can you get it all out? <laughs> Just coughing a little bit. Pride needs to go. You can't have both. You can't you can't pretend like you don't have it. If you have it, you have it. Acknowledge it. And then surrender it. Ask God to change your heart. If you're proud of your pride, you're a fool. Sorry. It's only an illusion of grandeur that you're holding on to. It's a delusion of something worth fighting for, worth striving for. And all it is ultimately is the desperate graspings of a hopeless person trying to hold on to something that makes them feel validated because they so need the validation. You don't need validation in the kingdom of God in the same way that you do when you're all you have to justify you is your pride. Because validation in the kingdom of God comes simply from being a child of God. And it ends up being enough because you sit in the embrace of the Holy Spirit 
which reminds you of how proud God is of you. Which reminds you of how happy God is with you. And how amazing you are to him. Because you, in order to be reborn, part of being reborn is acknowledging that a life was given for you. And it was God's. Mm -hmm. Jesus was sent. God was, Jesus was God's own. He surrendered himself for us. Because he wanted us saved, we meant enough to go through that, to suffer, to become one of us. His pride, his ego, was set aside. Mm -hmm. God didn't need to do any of that. He chose to. So now it's our turn to take our pride and our ego, our pride, that thing that makes us think that we're good enough, makes us think that we're better even than others. And our ego, that manifested identity that's so important to us and yet so meaningless on a cosmic scale. What do you win if you make yourself look like the person you want to look like and lose your soul? Nothing just an old age full of regret. <laughs> just drop it all, turn to God, and be saved. And then live, truly live. Because life in humility is, it's so good. It's so good to live in. The purity of being able to acknowledge that you're good enough. The purity of being able to accept where you're not. The purity of being able to hear God without having to fight with yourself over it. Yeah. It's all worth it. It's all so worth it. And to not need to prove yourself every day. Mm. That alone is can be one of the best parts. Anyway. That's what I've got for today, though. <laughs>